Hey lovers, welcome to TSPN. We are so excited today to give you guys a special interview with somebody who we both admire and have been following on TikTok. So this gentleman, his name is Mark. He is also known as Papa Flow XS on TikTok. And he has really kind of blown up and gotten a huge following by talking about his experience becoming a super Swifty through his experience with his son, Kevin, who is a dancer on the Eras tour. So we are just a few degrees from Taylor at this point. Super excited to talk to him a little bit about the Eras tour. We get into the audition process. We also talk with him about what it's like to raise children in the dance industry. And then ultimately just hear his story. It's such a great, compelling interview. So without further ado, this is a previously recorded interview. So we will cut over to Mark and let you guys listen along. Mark, do you want to first, while we kind of kick this off, share a little bit of why you would be on a Taylor Swift podcast? <laughs> well, um, I guess the, the the main reason would be because my son, Kevin, is one of the Eras Tour dancers. Kevin is the, uh, the young man with the long curly hair. Um, he's been a dancer for many years. I actually have two sons who are both professional dancers, and they both moved to Los Angeles a couple of years ago to pursue the dream of being this kind of dancer. So uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun. Did I expect to be any you know anywhere near the whole Swifty that whole environment? Not really. Uh, our our original. We had always promised the boys that if they booked a tour, like a world tour, a big job, that we would be at show number one. Like that was, it was a given. It didn't matter where it was. Mom and I were going to be there. We were going to watch and we were going to be cheering from the, from the stands. So um, we made the trek to Arizona for night one. Kevin was able to get us some tickets. Um, we were sitting uh, so A stage is the big stage where the band is, and then B stage is the diamond shape, and then C stage is the small little one at the very end of the runway. So we were B stage uh, off to the side. So Kevin told us that that was the side where he does his bejeweled solo. So we sat on that side so that we would have an unobstructed view of Kevin's little solo during bejeweled. And uh, I did one of my viral videos on TikTok was my apology to the Swifties because my wife and I were not Swifties at the time. We knew, you know, blank space, whatever. The, the, the radio hits we were aware of, um, a couple of other songs here and there, but we had no idea what to expect. We thought we were going to a regular concert and then, I mean, immediately when it started, we were all excited to see the opening because we had we had a little bit of an idea of what was going on. We didn't understand what it was with the the flower petals or the mm -hmm. wings or whatever you call what for Miss Americana. Um, so when the crowd sort of erupted as the clock, you know, spun mm -hmm. and disappeared and like. 70,000 people went absolutely insane. My wife and I were like, what's happening? Like, what is going on? Everybody starts scream singing. Like we were surrounded by people who knew every word to every song. And we were kind of like, were you scared? <laughs> it, it's not even scared. It wasn't even really scared. It was like, wow, this is intense, yeah. right? This is seriously intense. And we didn't sort of see it coming. And we were more, I don't want to say preoccupied, but our big concern, like I bought a brand new phone a couple of weeks before we left for Arizona oh. because I wanted to be able to capture everything in, you know, like 4K, whatever. And I wanted to film as much as I possibly could of Kevin so that I could look back on it afterwards. And then this funny thing happened was I just went on TikTok. I created a TikTok account so I could watch the lives. Ah, That's the, the only reason I even created a TikTok account was I found out that, sorry, young people, but <laughs> that young people will stand for three hours with their phone in their hand and 
live stream a concert, I would never dream of doing such a thing. No. Like my generation, right? We would never, we, we might film a little bit, but we're more, we want to watch, but, and, and I would have never thought to stream it for thousands of other people to watch. So I created the TikTok account when I found out that people were live streaming. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, it's not as prevalent on Instagram, but on TikTok, it's literally, I mean, there's lots of people now and, and it's fantastic to, to be able to do it. So we, we were watching the lives all the time. And then I just went on one day and I was like, there are a couple of poses in the red era where the, the, the boys are on the stage mm -hmm. with Taylor and there are those poses. So there's the pose at the end of 22 with everybody where the, the number stops right before they take her t-shirt off and she does the transition. There's that pause. And it's a beautiful shot of all the dancers with Taylor, but I could never quite get it laid out properly. Like somebody get a really nice picture. And then the other one is after we are never ever getting back together where Taylor's with just the boys and there's this pose at the end. So I went on TikTok and basically created a video saying, Kevin's my kid. Can you send me these videos, screenshots, whatever pictures? And yeah, it kind of, you know, yeah, the Swifties, the Swifties jumped community. in to help, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I, I had no idea how how friendly of a group they are, like to accept a, a, an old guy like me who was literally turning into a Swifty after I went to the concert, right? Like you guys are all Swifties and you go to the concert. I went to the concert and then I became a Swifty in in sort of interacting with all of you guys on TikTok. It was, it was really cool the way that everybody has sort of accepted you guys don't care you guys don't care that i'm a guy you don't care that i'm a dad you don't care that i'm in my 50s like you guys just don't care everybody's been super supportive and amazing and it's like oh my god so many comments on my tiktok now are like um people saying every time i see kevin i think oh my god i follow his dad on tiktok and stuff <laughs> like, like i i think that's so cool because i just i, I never saw it coming yeah Going um, real quick, you had mentioned the beginning of the lover set when they come out with the petals or the shells or whatever those are. Kevin's one that has one of those, right? Yes. Yep. How? OK, I've always wondered this. How difficult and heavy is that? So it's it's not heavy. It's awkward, as I understand it. So they've got the arm things that they have to hold. And then there's like a, a strap that straps almost like a harnessy kind of a thing with their body. It's just on the, I mean, it's very tall, like it's 20 something feet mm -hmm. tall. Right. So it's, it's awkward because it's kind of like a, a boat sail almost right. The, the, the material. So when the, like I did a video on this as well, because they have different formations for that opening number, depending on how windy it is. Hmm. So in a closed stadium, you'll see, I think it's six or eight, maybe six. They're all there and there's no spotters. And then on other windy days, there's less of them. And then on super windy days, which are generally the open stadiums, there are spotters. Like they're literally, you'll see one person with the contraption and then there's another person without the contraption behind them to make sure they literally don't blow off stage. And you can see in the videos, like if you watch, like if you search TikTok, you can see how much the wind sort of moves those things around and how awkward it can be sometimes. Sometimes they even struggle to cover Taylor, right? Because she comes up on the lift. She's already covered. She comes up on the lift and they have to walk forward. And then the other pedals come down over top of them. But you can see how bad the wind interferes with that stuff. So in a closed stadium, it's very easy. Well, okay, not easy, but <laughs> it can be, it can, it's manageable, right? It's just that they, they have these different uh, methods to deal with how windy it's going to be. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. This, the oh. strength that it must require to, you know, you talk about the harness and stuff like that. It almost reminds me of like deep sea fishing or something like the way that it's like using like the whole body to ensure that they, uh, they can stay upright. So, um, yeah, that's extremely interesting. And I think, 
um, even some of the things you've mentioned, like the A stage, the B stage, the C stage, like some of that stuff is so, it's so minute, but we care. We care about that. And that's something I didn't know that they call it those different things. What's funny, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but the way they have to exit off the screen in that number, they actually have to fold it down and then they back in to the garage door opening at the stage, right? They can't fold it down and walk forward. They have to fold it down and then walk backwards. Yeah. I'm just going to sweep up all the dust on the stage. <laughs> Pretty much. That's not even something we would normally think about. No. So, <clears throat> no. wow. So let's back up a little bit um, with the boys, Michael and Kevin. When when was like the first signs that, that they showed interest in dance or when when was it that you and your wife said, oh, this could be a thing. Let's get them in a dance. So it started as sort of recreational. Um, the first class that anyone ever took was Michael. And I remember distinctly Michael was eight years old. And it was just a local city, like uh, city of Brampton here. They just had like a dance, little dance thing for eight to 10 year olds or eight to 12 year olds. And I remember my wife saying, because the boys have done Taekwondo. They're both black belts in Taekwondo. They've, we've done soccer. We've done swimming. We've done all kinds of stuff. Um, but my wife said, you know, Michael's always dancing around. He loves, he's like me. He loves the music. He loves to dance. So she signed him up for this class and she said, okay, don't forget Monday nights for the next eight weeks. You got to take Michael to dance class. And I said, yeah, okay, whatever, no problem. And then she giggled and she goes, oh, by the way, it's parent and child. <laughs> and I was like, what, what, do you, what do you mean it's parent and child? She goes, yeah, it's parent and child. It's fine. Just go. They're, they're just kids. They're just going to dance. So we walk into this recreation center and it's literally all moms and daughters. <laughs> and it's me and Mike. And there was one other, there was one other boy in the class but he was with his mom as well and the choreographer lady she was fantastic and Michael loved it and I had fun we filmed it so we had a recital at the end of the eight weeks and it was just you know my wife came and whatever we were doing silly dances and by the time the eight weeks had rolled around I think there was only three parents and three child left out of the whole group that started like every week less people showed up and so we did this little recital thing and Kevin was five mm -hmm. and he was, we used to call him, um, we used to say like we gave him too much sugar all the time because he was always jumping around and they, he was just crazy. So while we were doing this uh, recital, Kevin was dancing around to the music and having a ball and um, we filmed the recital and we took it home and Michael and Kevin watched it literally like every night rewatched and rewatched and rewatched. And then um, Michael said he wanted to continue dancing that he had a really good time. So my wife found a different program that was no parents. My God, it was <laughs> yeah, just, just kids. Right. So she signed up Michael and when we got there the first night, it was the same choreographer and um, we were just talking and, and I said, Oh, Kevin really had a ball. Kevin's been watching the videos for, you know, since the recital. And she goes, no way, really? Like, and Kevin was too young to be signed up or we, my wife would have signed him up to begin with, but he was too little. The, 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 he didn't qualify age wise. And uh, the lady, Ashley, uh, we said, Kevin, show Ashley a couple of the moves that you remember for the video. So here's little five-year-old Kevin, and he's doing all these moves that Michael had learned in the class. And uh, she's like, oh, my God, he's adorable. And and he looks like he's having so much fun. You know what? Just leave him here, <laughs> and we won't tell anybody. Just drop him off with Michael and leave him here. And that, and that was it. And then it, it was – and it from so from there – it was very recreational. It was one day a week and um, they had a ball. They were enjoying it all the time. Like they loved it. And then my wife looked around for um, more sort of not competitive, but a little more advanced 
classes. So they're still very young. They're like, Michael was maybe 10 years old at that point, And then Kevin was like seven or eight. And um, it just kind of rolled from there. So we started, then it was like twice a week. And then we switched dance studios. And then you could tell that they were genuinely interested in learning and performing. And then they got a couple of tastes of actually performing in front of an audience. And then it just, it just sort of snowballed from there. And then we, we jumped, we did like three different dance studios across 10 years time. We went from recreation to full on comp classes where, you know, now they're, now they're training three times a week for a couple hours a, a day. And uh, the performances just kind of spawned from there. And um, my wife is really good at finding cool things to do. So she's she would look and she'd be like, oh, this choreographer is coming to Toronto on this date. So I've signed up the boys for this. And then this person is coming here. And then she started looking outside of our area and then we traveled so we went to vegas and then we started doing our what we called the annual pilgrimage to los angeles because los angeles is the place to be for training in dance like there is nothing as intense as los angeles training because you're literally surrounded by people who are doing this for a living how sorry how old were they when you started the pilgrimage to la <sighs> Michael was probably 12. Oh, wow. Yeah, give or take. We had a lot of trouble with Kevin in the beginning because he was so young that people would look at him and go, you can't bring a 10-year-old or a 9-year-old into class. And we were like, no, no, I can bring a 9-year-old into class. Like, trust me, he's fine, right? Yeah. And then when people started to experience that, I mean, Kevin by – so Kevin – was 12 so michael was like uh 14 15 they were full-on comp dancers they were on the um they were on a competitive team they were on a performance company like they were doing stuff it, it got to be a lot like it was our weeks were filled with the dance and um we had always we had always wanted them to experience outside of the dance studio. And we got a lot of flack for that back in the day because the comp studios wanted to keep you inside of their comp studio world. Yeah. And they didn't like when you exited from there and started doing things with other people and in other places. And our philosophy was always the, the more people you experience in life with teaching, with teachers, like there's a reason when we're young, we have the same teacher all day for all the classes, right? So we have math. It's the same teacher for math and English and whatever. And then we get to a certain age and then it's not one teacher all day. You move classes because you're going to the teacher who knows how to do that. And that's what we try to sort of incorporate into the boys dance training was we want them to learn from all different people, right? We don't want them to be used to one choreographer and then they show up at an audition and the person running the audition is a totally different style of teaching and a totally, and like we wanted them to be able to walk into a room and not be afraid of anything. Yeah. Right? They've seen, they've seen a couple hundred different choreographers. Nothing's really going to phase them anymore. They can just walk in and go, okay, whatever. I got it. No problem. So we, we were surrounded by people who all said they wanted to become professional dancers. But those people weren't doing sort of what we were doing. We were intentionally flying to the U.S. You know, once, once every couple of months, we would go for a weekend. We'd go to Washington. We'd go, like, all over the place. And it was to expose the boys to different choreographers, to different styles of teaching, even to not necessarily different styles of dance, because predominantly it was all hip hop um, in and around, right? Hip hop, a little bit on the jazz funk kind of side of things. Um, and we wanted them to experience all of that so that they were prepared to do this. But 
the people we were surrounded by all kind of looked at us and go, why are you going to, why are you going to Buffalo for the weekend? Or why are you yeah. going to Chicago for the weekend? Like, what's this all about? And we were like, okay, we just, that's, I, I had always said we wanted to give them the, um, the best possible education in dance. If this is what you're going to do, then I want you to learn as much as you can from as many people as you can, because you can absorb that. And that creates the kind of dancer you, you're, you want to be right. You take the best bits from everybody. You learn the things that you don't like when you watch someone else do it and you go, okay, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I don't like that, but I do like this. And you add it to your repertoire and you just keep building and building and building till the point where you're, you're ready. You can, you can take on anything and, that's where we got them to. And then we, they decided they wanted to move to California and, and we put all our effort into going there. Well, and one thing to hit on too, I know you mentioned Vancouver earlier and then you just said coming to the U S. So I guess we probably should explicitly let everyone know where do you reside? You're in Canada, correct? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Team Unstoppable headquarters is uh, just outside of Toronto, Canada. Okay. Perfect, perfect. Which is, explains my funny accent if you're going to make fun of uh, the oot and whatever you guys say that we do that I don't do. But I love the different accents. Yes. Um, so I, I wanted to ask, too, if when you were taking the boys to learn some different styles of dance from different choreographers flying to the different places, two-part question here. The first part is, did they ever get combative or like not really want to do that at some point? And two, what were some of the hardships that your family faced during all this? Hardships? Not really. Like I, I own my own, I own my own business up here. It's a family business. I've been here for like 35 years. Um, I was able to just, if I, if I wanted a Friday off, I would just tell everybody, Hey, I'm not here on Friday. And we would fly out Friday morning or whatever. And then we'd fly home Sunday night. You know, um, did it cost us money? Absolutely. Did we treat it like work? No, we, we treated it like an adventure. Yeah. And we made memories. Like some of my favorite times were literally me sitting in an auditorium in a chair, listening to loud music, watching my kids dance on stage or on the carpet or on the floor, like the, and, and the conversations that we would have after the classes, because they come out so in like invigorated, so excited after experiencing new things. And what we learned was artists inspire other artists. Like there's a reason that artists collab with other artists because they get together and sparks fly. Sorry for the bad pun, but it's <laughs> no, I love it. it. It just it it it's magic. It happens, and it's very cool to witness. And it's I don't know, like as a parent, it just it's it's amazing um, to to watch it. And we we did all these we did all this traveling with the hopes because when enough people start telling you that your kids are talented enough to do this for a living, like the dance world is kind of, there's, there's a lot of fakey sort of, Oh my God, you were amazing. Oh my God. That was so great. Like there's a lot of that, but when you meet an absolute perfect stranger for the very first time and he's from another country and he's doing this for a living and he says at the end of class, um, Oh, your parents are here. Can I meet them? And the boys would come out and get us and they'd be like, yeah, so-and-so wants to meet you. And we would come in and they go, your kids are fantastic. Like they need to be doing this. You need to get them to California. You need to like, you need to do. And if you need any help, give me a call. Here's my phone number or whatever. And I can do what I can to help because it's, it's not an easy thing for a Canadian to move to California and work legally. It is That's a very true. complicated, expensive process. So you, they call it exceptional. You have to prove that you're exceptional. So that means you have to show that in your home country, you've done this and this and this and this, and you've made lots of money and you made this and you made that. And then U.S. immigration will look at that and go, oh, okay, yeah, I Googled them. I see that they've done this and I see that they've done that. And then 
you get the O-1 visa and it's a, it's a three year term and you have to reapply after those three years to get a renewal. So it's, 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 a, it's a difficult process to, yeah. to be able to, from any one other country to come to the U.S. and work to do this. Do you and the, and the kids have dual citizenship now then? No, no, no. I have, my wife and I are Canadian. The boys are Canadian technically, but they are in the U.S. on a work visa. Got it. Makes sense. And to answer the other part of your question, we, they never kicked back because for them, it was always exciting to go somewhere else. Yeah. It was always interesting. And uh, I remember we, we planned a trip. So they had done lots of competitions here locally and we planned a trip. There's a, there's a big, I don't even know if it's still happening, but it used to be called hip hop international. And it was a gigantic worldwide competition. And in that year it was in Las Vegas and uh, I remember sitting with the boys. We told them that we were going to fly for, you know, I think we went for a whole week. We were going to Vegas we, and they had what they call workshops. So you could watch the competition on certain days. And then there was a couple of days of workshops where they brought in guest choreographers and you could sign up for class. So we showed them this little flyer and it had like eight different choreographers listed on it. And I handed it to Mike and I said, can you let me know what classes you want to take when we're in Las Vegas? And he looked at the flyer and he didn't really recognize very many names, but he went, yeah, this person and this person and maybe this person. And he goes, why are you asking? And I went, I'm not really because you're doing them all. Like, I don't care. You're, you're, you're doing them all. If I'm going to fly you to Las Vegas, you are going to dance in every single one of them. I don't care if you know them, you don't know them. You're just going to dance. You're just going to learn. You're just going to experience everything. And the funny part about that story was the, his favorite class, their favorite class of that two day experience was somebody that they had never heard of before. Hmm. Yeah. That's a good lesson, you know? Right. Were, were they homeschooled then or like, did they have a tutor or did they go to regular school? They, they went to a regular high school. They were both in the, we have like a regional arts program. So there's drama and dance. And so they were in the dance program. They both went to the same high school. They both did the same program, just a little bit apart. And um, what we told them, because they kept pushing that, you know, like I would come home from work and we would have dinner and they would look at their phone, they go, hey, dad, uh, so-and-so is teaching tonight downtown. Can we go? And I was like, okay, all right, I guess we're going. So I'd look at my wife and be like, okay, we'll drive down. And then a dance parent life is is horrible. You literally drop them off. You sit in the car for two hours while they're in class and you wait for them to come back. And that's, that's what we did. My wife, we had a little tablet. We used to download movies and put them on the tablet, put the tablet on the dash, and we'd just sit in the car and watch watch a, a TV show or a movie or whatever until they were done. And then we drive home and the drive home was always the funnest part of the whole thing because they were so excited and they were so hyped up after the class that they would just get in the car and they'd be like, oh, and the whole ride home, they were just talking. It was like a 45 minute to an hour ride home and they would just nonstop talk about how cool it was and how they were dancing beside so-and-so. And like they had their own idols here in Toronto and once their level started elevating to a point, I don't even think they saw it yet, but we started seeing that they were getting, they were sort of moving up in the ranks, so to speak, right? Like we had our, we had our sort of top dancers of Toronto and they were slowly making their way up towards that and they didn't see it yet. But you could tell when they were doing the groups at the end, all of a sudden they were like, oh my God, I was dancing beside so-and-so and we did, we did, we made the final group and I was dancing beside so-and-so and my wife and I were like, yeah, that's because you're getting to that point now. Yeah. We, um, we told them at one point that if you want to pursue this, then there's no complaining. That was the rule. So if you wanted to do a performance and that rehearsal went till two o'clock in the morning or one o'clock in the morning and we didn't get home till two o'clock in the morning. You were not going to bellyache at six 30 in the morning when your alarm goes off because you got to go to school 
as soon as you start complaining and saying, oh, I'm too tired to go to school, okay, we're not doing this anymore, right? You've got to, you've got to show you're committed. I will stay up until one or two in the morning and I will get up the next morning and I will go to work. I will do that for you if you do that. If you don't do that, forget it. I'm out. Yeah. Right? So as long as you're in, I'm in. So, Mark, I'm dying to know with two sons, Jesse, for a fun fact, has three sons. And obviously they were very athletic. Did they beat each other up? Like, were they getting along as kids? Like, was it just like a zoo in your house? Like, it just feels no. like it could have gone the other way. We had we had a lot of outlets like they were doing Taekwondo. So they yeah. were getting sort of the they were getting the combat sort of stuff at Taekwondo. So it didn't happen a lot at home. They were more just about playing Pokemon and doing whatever. Good. And like it, it really wasn't, um, I really wasn't sure they fought, whatever, like yeah, all yeah, siblings oh, yeah. are going to fight. Right. So that, that was, never, but no, did they ever, you know, beat the heck out of each other? No. Oh, that, well, that's good. Maybe, well, that's the advice <laughs> to parents who are listening is put your kid in dance class or Taekwondo if they're beating each other Keep up. Keep them occupied. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I have boys 12, 10, and 7, and they're all very much like my oldest is. You got to find their passion, yeah. right? Yeah. So, like, we've tried so many different sports, and it just so happens my 12-year-old loves and is really good at basketball. So now he's on a travel team, you know. Um, my middle one, quiet, likes to read. And then my little one is drama. He loves acting. He just got his first acting gig in the high school play at 7 years old. That's so awesome. Yeah, how lucky though yeah. for you, Mark, that your two kids had, you know, the similar interests. So my question yeah. would be, did they compete a lot? Like, was there ever jealousy or competition kind of growing up in that environment or that you recall? Or even, I mean, they're both professional now. Like, I'm sure they are so supportive of each other. So that may be a silly question, but as siblings, there might have been some rivalry. There, there will always um there there was a little bit back then um kevin kevin his nick like if you if you look for his instagram his instagram is still kevin underscore kid underscore xs and he he chose that like when he was 12 years old or 10 years old or 11 years old and um it was always the xs was always because he was the smallest kid in class right but he was adorable. He, he, he's been growing his hair since he was eight years old. So he didn't really cut his hair. Once he hit eight, he just let it grow and let it grow and let it grow. Um, Michael was more of a, he was more of an emo kid. So at one point he kind of had the long hair covering his eye and stuff. <laughs> so what ended up happening here was Michael's look was very specific. So when they started to be able to go for jobs, it was a little more difficult for Michael because of his look. Uh, whereas Kevin was just, Kevin is, um, my wife is Filipino. Um, so Kevin's kind of got a more racially ambiguous look. Mm -hmm. Whereas Michael's definitely got the Asian look to him. Um, so Kevin, like they just, Kevin booked a lot of little things back when he was very young. Um, and then Michael cut his hair, changed his appearance, and then they were both booking stuff right after that. Like they did the Disney movies. They were in zombie. Michael was in Zombies One. Uh, Michael and Kevin were both in Zombies Two. And then before they left for California, they did. Uh, There's another one called Spinderella. All Disney movies. They're all on Disney Plus. And uh, sneak. Sorry, Sneakerella and Spin were the last two Disney movies that they did before they moved down to uh, LA. Well, how, how ironic that the Aerostar movie is now on Disney Plus. So he can on add Disney another Plus. one of those yes. to the list. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about the journey to success there, right? So what did that look like as far as, you know, you obviously took them to dance classes and did all the hoopla as a parent. What did success look like for them? And like, how did they get to the place where they were both I mean, wildly successful on world tours. It's, it's a, it's a pretty brutal industry. Um, in general, uh, I, I made, I made a video about it 
where there's a lot of no's in mm-hmm. the industry. Like it's the majority of this industry is no's. And um, I, I think a lot of normal sort of nine to fivers don't quite get that because I had a couple of comments where there were people would say, well, that's just like any other job where sometimes they give it away to somebody and you don't understand why they, you were more qualified, but they gave it to somebody else anyways. And that's true, except you're not applying for a job once a week or once every two weeks, right? Whereas like you have to take the errors tour for what it is. It is the exception, mm-hmm. right? Most world tours aren't two years, no. right? Period. Um, most world tours aren't weekends only the way that the Eras tour has been predominantly weekends only. Right. So when they were, they had the ability to go home after a weekend, right. So they could go back to their house and then they would fly to the next city. Um, that's not the norm. So you can't take what you see for the Eras tour as the norm for the dance industry because it's just not right. Yeah. The norm for a dance industry is, oh, I booked the music video on Thursday, but I have a self-tape on Friday morning, and then I have an aud- a live audition, or I have a call back next week. And it's constant. Like, it it never ends. It's fine for Kevin because he's busy. But every every other professional dancer who's not on a world tour is literally doing this every day. And it's tough. Like, it's tough to hear no, 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 all the time. And there's not even a reason. Like they just, they just don't call. Yeah. Right. They just don't call. You just don't get it. Okay. So now let's get to the Eras tour here. I know Michael and Kevin both got a call to audition, correct? Correct. So walk us through that process and what happened. So it was a closed call, which means, um, you it's like invite only almost um so the the team they didn't even say what the artist who the artist was they just said it's an a-list artist there's an audition uh, and it's usually broken apart by male and female so they'll be like okay men are at 2 p.m women are at 4 p.m and then they usually break it apart by agency so that you're not intermingling different agencies it's all the people from this agency come in this time slot and all the people from this agency come at a different time. And then it's usually like a, a round where they teach choreography and then they cut and they just literally, they'll just chop the field in half and they'll be kid like everybody on the right hand side of the room, stay everybody on the left. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. And they're gone. And what they usually do is they will whittle it down. They never said how many people they were hiring. They usually don't. Mm -hmm. Um, So you don't really know. And they usually do the cuts, you know, excuse me, two or three times. And then you're left with a group at the end. And then that group is usually filmed very like sort of detailed. You do your slate. They might ask you a couple of questions, but they film it all. And then they take, I think, uh, for this one, it was like probably around 30 people were left. Wow. And then they took all those videos and that goes to the camp. And then the, the decision is it's not in any one person's hands. It's kind of because the choreographer only has so much say and the choreographer will basically say, okay, here's 30 people. I can work with any of these 30 people. You guys pick who you want. And then the decision then becomes, okay, do we want how many girls, how many guys, what, you know, what appearance sort of look, what looks are we going for? And then they select based on that. Is that Taylor or 13 management? No, I don't know. They they never really said no. It's like the Royal family, the palace. Um, Yeah. yeah. So we know that Mandy Moore, not to be mistaken for the actress Mandy Moore, but Mandy Moore, the choreographer, was the choreographer for the Eras Tour. So was she part of that? When you say like the choreographer would have chosen 30 that they could work with, was that who would have been part of it or was that potentially a later date that she joined? No, no, no. She was there. Yeah. She was, she was, she was running the audition because you have to, you have to, from that perspective, the choreographer knows what she 
like Mandy knows what she's what she wants to do, and she wants to make sure that the people that she's going to then say I can work with have the ability to do what she has in her brain. Mm-hmm. I love that. So Michael and Kevin both were toward the end of the selection yes. process, correct? Yes. Okay. So what was that call like when Kevin got the job, Michael did not, what happened with that? You, you always have to look at this stuff. Like it's just not meant for you, right? Like it's cause you just beat yourself up if you, right. You just have to know that whatever the universe is doing its thing and it's, it's giving what it thinks belongs with each person. And there's nothing else. There's no other way to look at it, right? You can, you can be mad, you can be sad, you can be whatever, but it just, there's no other way to deal with it because it'll eat you up. Well, and Michael has had wild success, correct? What tour? He's gone on tours with other huge people as well. So Michael was on, Michael just recently did um, the Mariah Carey Christmas tour. That was like no November, December. Yeah. So Thanksgiving weekend for you guys, it's not the same weekend for us, but that Thanksgiving weekend for you, Michael was with Mariah and Kevin was with Taylor. So super cool, right? Yeah, like, absolutely. Um, Michael was also part of the, um, the Megan Trainer music video, Mother. The one that went like crazy viral, like 15 million views on, on uh, you, YouTube. He was in, he was all over Times Square. I've got screen captures of them promoting the music video for that song where you can clearly see Michael on the, on the, you know, all the billboards on Times Square. It was very cool. And then Kevin for the same thing when they released the Harris tour film. I love that. Um, yeah. Did, um, okay. So, when Kevin got picked for the Eras tour, did he know it was Taylor yet? Or did, at what point did he find out it was, at what point did he find out it was for Taylor Swift? I think they all had an idea, but it was never really said. Uh, I, I think it's kind of hard to, uh, to hide at some point. Yeah. I think, I think what helped was, Mandy had never worked with Taylor before, so nobody pieced the two together that it was Andy because Taylor had always worked with Tice before that, right? So it was, I think that kind of threw everybody for a bit of a loop. Were you were you there when Kevin got the call or how was that like experience for him? No, um, nope. He, he just got a call from his agent. He was in his apartment in California and he got the call. Wow. Right. Did he know how big this era's tour was going to be at the time? No, I don't think anybody did. No. Yeah. I mean, this is probably going to, I mean, this is going to be the biggest tour of all time. I think so too. Cause if you look at everybody else's world tours, nobody's doing yep. two years, right? Like everybody's jamming, you know, all the, the entire world into three or four months. It's not two years. Right. I, right. I don't think any, her, I don't I don't think anybody has the uh, stamina to do <laughs> this this much. Yeah. Yeah. Biggest tour of all time like that. That makes me emotional to think about you as a father and the, the pride that comes with that. So where in the journey, focusing on your experience, understanding that he had gotten this job, like where did you realize how big it was? Probably night one in Arizona. Like when you, we don't have stadiums that big like you yeah. guys do, right? Like you can, you can see why Taylor has to do six shows in Toronto because the place only holds 50,000 maybe at the very most, right? When you're squeezing them in and that stage is so big that it takes up so much room on the floor that yeah. you're losing all that extra space, right? So you guys have all the football stadiums. You guys are used to having 70,000 people. I had never seen 70,000 people in one place at one time ever before. So yeah. I think it kind of, I think it kind of set in for me as a parent at that point. And uh, it, I'm super emotional anyways, like w even watching the film when we were in the music, like when we were in the, in the theater, you're watching the film and you know, it, it starts and I'm, I'm immediately emotional because at no point did I think that, 
I had dreamed that they would go on tour. That was always the common goal. The common goal was to move to California and to do this professionally. So they, it's funny when, when we moved them, they moved in August and I remember we were down there for a couple of weeks and we had rented an apartment and we had bought a bunch of Ikea that the, my, that's where my kids learned to put Ikea furniture together. <laughs> Cause that's what you do with your first place, right? You learn how to put Ikea furniture together. So we did that. And I remember at the end of that two weeks leaving and I, of, of, of the two of us parents, I'm the emotional one always. Um, and we walked out of the apartment and my wife was crying and I wasn't. <laughs> and I was walking away going, this is, right. this feels right. This is, this is what we worked so hard for. We spent years and lots of time and effort and money to have this moment. And it just felt right. Right. It just, it, it all fit into place and it felt right. And I just walked away and I was like, okay, we did it. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's, um, let's talk about the era's movie for a minute. Um, I personally was shocked when I was watching the lives in LA night one, two, and three, that she was filming for a movie. I thought I knew she'd film a tour documentary. I just thought it would be at the end. So I was just surprised that it was done so soon and then it was released so soon. So how far in advance did Kevin know about the movie being filmed? Not very. Yeah. Well, and I think no. about how you just bought that iPhone or the, whatever you said, a nicer phone with the, the better camera. <laughs> yeah. Team Android. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So you had bought, you had bought a really <laughs> nice camera. Jesse actually yeah. has an iPhone and she hates it. So she's like a big fan of Androids. Um, but you know, you're probably bending over backwards to get the best photos. And then now there's this, I mean, beautifully produced and not to say it has every angle or shot that you had really hoped for when you went and saw it live, but what a momentum to have everything that he is doing. And as a father to be able to capture that really in perpetuity and well, if you have a Disney plus subscription, of course. Right. <laughs> well, I'm still hoping one day for a DVD. Yeah. I hope given given her uh the fact that she's always releasing like you can still buy a cassette right she yeah. sells the she sells cd she sells cassettes she sells vinyl i'm hoping one day that we will get the eras tour on a dvd even if dvds don't even ex like nobody uses them anymore it's fine i can i can watch it yep like in 30 seconds i can watch it on my phone it's cool but i would love to have the dvd just for a keepsake almost more than anything else. But exactly. yeah, like we, we, the first time we went to see the movie, um, I, I literally dressed, I got dressed up like I, cause I was already a Swifty at that point. Like yeah, I yeah. had, I had moved through the phases, right. I, I probably still in the apprenticeship phase, but I, I'm definitely moving towards it. But yeah, I, I had a, I had an old cardigan, from the 80s that I wore and I have some really cool Jordans that are very bejeweled like they they match the bejeweled they've got little almost sparkly things on them and stuff so I wore those and I have a purple pair of jeans so like I was decked out I had friendship bracelets made that yep. say Papa Flo XS <laughs> and we were sitting in the theater and the, literally the opening had started and it was just the clock and it was the sort of the intro before Miss Americana starts. And uh, my wife looked over at me and I'm literally like, there's tears streaming down my face. And she just laughed. Like she just looked over and she goes, Oh my God, already <laughs> for real. Right. And I just, yeah, I just never in a million years would I have expected to see my kid in a movie theater. Like I was excited when they released zombies, but that went, straight to Disney plus. So I sat on my couch, I had a beer, we watched the right, we watched the movie. This was totally different. This is literally in a movie theater and I'm watching my kid on the screen. It was well, and we don't have Crazy. kids in the Eras Tour movie. And I think Jesse and I, I don't know about you, Jesse, but I cried in the intro too. So yeah. I'd like just multiply that times 10,000, I'm sure. It, there's at least once during every concert that I watch live that I cry about something. I don't know what it is. And I mean, this so, okay, 
So I, in like in research for this interview, I watched the Eras Tour movie again on Disney Plus the other night. And I saw for the first time I noticed Kevin has the solo in, in Bejeweled. He has this muscle and I gasped. I'm like, oh my gosh, he's got that solo. How cool is that? So many people said that to him when they actually saw the movie. Actually, even some of the some of the tour people were like, "Kevin, I didn't know you had a solo in Bejeweled." And and I, because everybody knows Cam, mm -hmm. and Cam is the most yeah. followed of all the dancers on any social media platform. Everybody knows Cam solo, and I've I've seen people comment and be like, "What happened to Cam's? Like, why? Basically, why the hell was Kevin doing?" a solo and bejeweled that's cam's job and it was like no no there's two yeah kevin's mm -hmm. is the first one and then cam's is the second one and it's been like that since day one right it's kevin's kevin's little moment that's that's the one but yeah it if you look at the lives it's better lit in the actual movie but sometimes in the live depending on the angle of where the camera is it's a little dark on that side of the stage so sometimes it's a little harder to sort of see Kevin's little solo. Well, and there's so much going on. You know, when I went to the Eras tour, I was very high up in the, um, you know, stadium seating. And so at some point you're not looking at every dancer at every point. I mean, there's just so much, you know, distance. Right, between everything going yeah. on in the background and then Taylor and then all the dancers. And yeah, it's a lot. Yep. Yeah, and I kind of, I mean, I kind of had this same type of experience, but I was, my, I was super close. So I didn't see the LED stage. I didn't, I don't know if you're familiar with Soldier Field in Chicago at all, but that's where I saw her. And it, we were like section A on the floor, row nine, seat one and two. So we were right there. So I didn't, a lot of the times I was looking behind them because she was out at the end of the stage and we were, we were right where she'll do like the Evermore set. And right. the folklore set and that you can see really well but um yeah we didn't see i didn't see any of the led pyrotechnic stuff until the era's movie yeah it's so funny how different everyone's experience is and you know there's benefits to all of them um you know my eyebrows almost lit on fire from the bad blood pyrotechnics that's how high <laughs> up i was like it was intense um but yeah, no, I love that the solo was not only captured, but just the, I mean, the whole aura of the dancers, right? They are such a huge part of why the show, I mean, if you imagine Taylor being alone on that stage, just her, it wouldn't be as captivating. It wouldn't be as important. And the dancers play such a huge piece to telling the story around all of the songs that she's singing. Well, now that they've been in Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, Sydney, I mean, Singapore. Okay, so how does Kevin, when you get those phone calls home, how is he enjoying those different cultures and countries? Uh, Japan was his favorite. He just loved, he was like, he, he messaged us and he goes, Dad, the food at 7-Eleven is incredible. And and I'm thinking like 7-Eleven for you and I. And it's like, I wouldn't eat at 7-Eleven. And he's like, oh no, it's not like that at all. And people have people have told us like 7-Eleven in Japan is amazing. He that was his favorite. He's an anime guy. He's a Pokemon guy. So it, everything in Japan was that was his thing. He loves rice. He loves like it that was just if 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 a country fit Kevin, Japan would be the one. But yeah, they have time. That's the cool thing is they have time to go sightsee and 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 do things outside of just being at work. So when they're out and about, you know, you talk about like Seven Eleven in Japan and stuff. Do they get recognized by locals? Like, are there um, any instances where you know fans are recognizing Taylor's backup dancers? Kevin said Japan was the country that he was the most tagged on Instagram and that they were the most recognized out and about like, well, as, as they were sort of traveling around and stuff, that was Japan. They do, they do get recognized obviously a lot more now than in the very beginning, because in the very beginning there was still a lot of rumbling on, on the internet. Like where are all the old dancers? Why, why isn't so-and-so here? Why isn't so-and-so there? And then sort of as the concert, sort of progressed a few months everybody was happy and everybody was like these dancers are great and 
and now they're all getting to that point where, yeah, where Kevin, Kevin can go incognito quite well. Um, he can hide himself a little better than maybe some of the other dancers. So he's, he's pretty good at it. He uh, puts his hair up and yeah. <laughs> changes yeah. his appearance. I know that you did a TikTok recently about um, them not being able to take pictures with fans. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's not so much the pictures. They can, they can take pictures. The issue is more the where than the actual pictures, right? So it's just you see Safety. what happens. Yeah, it, it, and that's what it is, right? It's, it's all about have to keep everybody safe. So yeah. if, if, you know, if you're out at a touristy spot, then maybe it's okay. Maybe it's not. To, nine times out of ten, it's probably better to just have a conversation with them instead of trying to take their picture because like like I said in my video, what you notice with all the dancers is they don't post anything about the country until they've left the country. Or in the case of Australia, they had left Sydney and gone to Melbourne or vice versa. And then they did one for one side and one for the other side, but they never, you know, they never yeah, post they're not. where they are, right? There's no tagging of anything that's, that, that's not, they're there as a tourist and they don't want to create a mess. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, one Instagram story that just hints at where they're at, you know, could cause thousands of people to assume that Taylor is there and to to go. And we've seen what happens when that sort of stuff goes on. So, yeah, no. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you had mentioned earlier about, you know, how Cam had initially gotten a ton of social media, you know, clout and influence. And so I wanted to just make sure we pause and give a moment to say where to find Kevin. I know you mentioned his handle earlier, but if you're listening to this now, this is your moment to pause and go follow. So what are his <laughs> handles on different social media? Um, so on Instagram, it's Kevin underscore kid underscore XS. I think his TikTok is just Kevin XS. I think that's how you tag him on Instagram. Um, I'm going to plug my other kid too, because I got to yes. do it. So yes. every Michael is Michael on everything is underscore Michael Trey. Okay. Okay. Love and, that. And well, he's and, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, exactly. Too, so. Well, and that's where this story is so insane to me because it's the double success. It's the fact that I'm sure there's a lot of, um, you know, support that they give each other and the fact that they both have their own careers in such a competitive industry is just, I mean, shout out to you as a dad and your wife for everything that you guys went through to get them there. Um, but knowing that we just mentioned their handles, you obviously started posting on TikTok months ago. Your handle is at Papa Flow XS. Let's talk about how that felt. Like when you first posted that video, you know, what we, was, a lot of your early ones took off pretty quickly. Is that correct? Yeah, because I, I didn't really expect uh, the response as such. And it was literally, there were, there were a couple um, one was me just asking for photographs and I guess a couple of people reposted it or more than a couple of people. <laughs> and then people were literally, um, just sort of talking. They were like, Oh my God, that's your kid. Okay. Let, I'm going on this day. Let me see what I can do. If I can get some pictures of Kevin or whatever. And it just sort of ballooned to the point where I, I, my phone is jammed full of videos and photographs and, you know, TikTok isn't very, easy to dm photograph like you can't send pictures in no. <laughs> in a dm so of course we have to shift to a different way and people were trying to send me videos and so we did a lot of that on instagram and stuff but yeah it was um one of one of my earlier ones was uh so the red era is my era okay that is Love that okay. is my that is that is my favorite um of the entire concert that's that's yeah. the one when, when I'm in my seat, like 22, I, I would love to be that guy. Cause I'm going to wear this shirt yes. and I'm literally going to be like, that's my son. Yes. 
while she puts the, while she puts the hat on my head and I hand her a little ah. Papa Flo XS friendship bracelet, like that would be for my birthday in 2024. Like that would be the ultimate. But so 22 is is sort of my favorite song in the Red era, and I was driving to meet some friends um, for lunch one day. And I was listening to the Eras Tour set list because I'm studying to become a super Swifty. Super Swifty. And I was still I was still learning the words to all the songs and stuff. And I'm literally singing 22 as I'm driving and I'm crying. Like I'm just crying. And I, I had to sort of regain myself, but I filmed uh, a sort of a, a thing about how this whole thing came about and how emotional it makes me feel not only that my kid is doing this but that the swifty community has been so amazingly friendly like let's be real the internet is almost as good as it is to bring us together it's almost better at tearing us apart so to be brought into an experience where it has been predominantly positive. Like everybody has just been, oh my God, that's your kid. Oh my God, that's amazing. Oh, look. And the tags that I get are just crazy. People yes. literally, they don't tag Kevin. They literally tag me, right? And they'll be like, Papa Flo XS, Papa Flo XS, Papa Flo XS. And I, I wake up every morning, I open my TikTok and I click on every one of them and I see what they're saying and watch the video, like the video, repost the video. So the journey for me for TikTok was, I don't know. I never, I never expected anyone to be even remotely interested in a mid fifties old guy who just talked in his car. Like that was, that's literally all I'm doing. Right. Yes. Well, and honestly, the way that you storytell is so fantastic. I think that's part of the appeal is like, you'll make a five minute video. And for those that don't follow Mark, <laughs> Papa Flo, yeah, <laughs> definitely go to his page because like they're captivating videos. You do great storytelling. Obviously in this interview, you can see that as well. But um, I absolutely agree. And I've I've found many people who don't fit the, you know, the young Swifty, you know, whatever people assume are going to be the Taylor Swift norm. And I think that's so fantastic. We actually had a woman, Bryn, shout out to Bryn, who reached out in our DMs. Um, she's a grandma, you know, and she said that she wanted to learn more through our podcast about the Swifty lore so that she could talk to, you know, her and her friends are all listening and want to talk to their granddaughters about Taylor. And so it does go beyond just like the music. And so, yeah, we, we love it. Every, I think everyone who's kind of joined the community has really seen that it's, it's probably more attractive to be not the normal and to really stand out in your own story of how you became a Swifty. Yeah, I think too, Mark, you followed me very early on when you got on TikTok and I, you've always been so gracious at commenting on my videos no matter how crazy they are and, and some of them are crazy <laughs> and some of them are very crazy um but no i just yeah her your storytelling it's fantastic and you know it's you're very humble to have two kids that are so successful i mean and you're successful yourself it's just very humbling like yeah the and this is a fan base unlike any other you'll ever see agreed agreed absolutely one of the things that I try to do with my TikTok videos is I know, um, I know Jesse, you, you, you obviously film inside of TikTok because you, you're pressing the pause button and you're great. Yeah. Right, like in your videos, you can tell, I, I never do that. I literally don't use TikTok to film my, my videos. I have a, a topic that I want to talk about and I literally put my camera in the cradle flip it around to selfie and I hit record and I just talk. And yeah, I've had, I've had the odd person be like, dude, I lost, I lost patience like two minutes in whatever. And, and it is what it is. Then you don't, you don't want to be here and that's cool. That's, that's your cool. choice. That's not my choice. Right. Just carry on, move on. Right. And I just, I like, I did one today on just calendar, like a shared calendar and a shared email, because I thought that was so helpful for us because we were so involved with our children. Like that's the hashtag team unstoppable was literally because when we decided 
this is what we were going to do. We were all four of us. We were okay, focused, right? We have a goal. All four of us are going to work toward this. And then we put things in place to allow that to happen so that we could all be working towards the same goal to make it happen. So yeah, is it, is it, is it cool? Absolutely. Is it what we dreamed about? Absolutely. Was that a lot of work? Hell yeah. Like 20 years. And it is not an overnight success. It is literally 20 years of effort in stages, right? And it just kind of, the stages just got bigger and bigger and bigger. So I'm curious to know, you're a Swifty now. So in the Eras tour, the Red Era is your favorite. What's your favorite album, though? And what's your favorite song? Currently, my favorite song, and I'm not sure when this will ever change, is Death by a Thousand Cuts. I just, there's something about that song. I have, I can't even tell you what it is. Okay, okay, maybe it's the flickering chandelier, because that's what I do for a living. I fix flickering lights. So maybe that's what it is. But I I love that song. I'm so happy that it got added to the Harris Tour film, that that was one of the songs that she did. Um. Album wise, I still I still think red, but my Swifty journey is not album specific because I'm trying literally like you guys were here for the long run. So you guys did album by album by album by album. I didn't have that luxury because I came in at the sort of not the end, but I came in now. So I was just trying to literally I'd go on Spotify and be like Eras Tour set list. And then yeah. I was grateful that they added songs every time she did a surprise song that they added it back into the playlist so I could listen and listen and listen. And then, like I said, I've never, I haven't learned this many lyrics to songs in like decades as I have in the last six or eight months. It's, it's amazing. And she's about to drop 20 more on us with tortured poets. So. <laughs> crazy, crazy. Yeah. It's yeah. Okay. So I have to ask this. Um, have you met Taylor? And if not, are you going to meet Taylor? Yeah, when he gets his have, 22 I, hat. I have, <laughs> I have, I, there's, if you look at my post, there's actually somebody created, I did a video and it was me, I, I guess, humbly asking, would you be okay as a Swifty group if I did? Or would you guys be like, oh, hell no, man. That guy's the dad of one of this is, this is BS. He shouldn't be getting the hat, whatever. So I did that video because I was like, okay, 22, that's my song, right? Uh, would it be cool? Sure. Are there way more deserving people than me? Absolutely. But has there ever been a 50 plus? Male? Well, I've heard a lot no. of discourse gotten, about right. that, you know, of like it's a lot of kids or you know younger, right. run, younger fans, and um, yeah, we would love to see it. I personally, well, I think it's funny because every reply to that post was, "Oh, absolutely, it needs to happen." People were tagging Taylor Nation. People were tagging Taylor Swift. It was very cool. I didn't expect it. I expected a bit of backlash, and then somebody posted a hashtag. And it's like Papa Flow XS 22 hat. And I was like, okay, cool. So I literally added it to my little auto text that I use when I do a post. I've got all the Taylor Swift hashtags that I include Mm -hmm. at the end of my posts. And I put that one in there. I'm like, hell, why why not? I'm going to give it a shot and see what happens. But no, I have have till November and we will, we'll promote it with you here. The like, yeah. Would I love to meet her? Obviously we all would love to meet her. I would have loved to go to the, the movie premiere yes i would have loved like i i need to get on that mailing list whatever that mailing list is where they get the promo boxes and where they like disney plus just sent out the blanket and all that like i i want to be on that mailing list like i'm not i'm not an influencer right yeah i I, like i'm not an influencer i'm just the guy who rambles on like i'm i'm like the era's tour dad chats guy like that's literally who I am, right? I, so. I love that reference. Um, well, it kind of, honestly, if you have direct, uh, you know, you've got a son who works within the realm of Taylor and you're not on the list, that doesn't make me very hopeful that I'll get on the list because I feel like <laughs> uh, if anyone can pull it off, uh, you definitely have more ties than we do. But yeah, we we absolutely feel that. And 
it's funny because, you know, even with the most recent PR push, like we have friends who have been, you know, growing their accounts or have huge accounts. And it's just such a funny mix of people who get it or don't get it. And um, it's just so exciting, honestly. Like I watched one of our friends open her box on TikTok and I was crying as if I opened the damn box and, you know, it's great. So, yeah. We'll plug, we'll plug your 22 hat here too. So Andrea, <laughs> Scott Swift, Taylor Nation, Taylor, give Mark the 22 hat in Toronto. There you go. For his birthday, yes. What, what's the tour date just birthday. so when we do talk about it that you'll be there? Um, it's the weekend of the 16th because okay. she does three shows and then there's, I think, two days off and then there's three more shows, something along those lines. So yeah, the 16th is one of the ones that I'm trying to get to. Okay. Um, I'm hoping for two. Yeah. That's my hope. Yeah. Well, we got to stick with it, right? Because that's all we're getting lately is yeah, the two. Yeah, the 22nd so. double. <laughs> Love that. Just for you, Jess. <laughs> Thank you. Do you know anything I don't, Mark? No, I don't. Okay. No, I don't, sadly. And even if I did, yeah, even if you did, I have to kill you. Yeah, right. (laughs) Is there anything we haven't covered that you would like to cover? I just, I think I just, if if you guys have the audience to just say thank you, like honestly, I think it's, Mm -hmm. I think it's super cool that seventeen point three thousand people have clicked the follow button, and I really hope you guys this TikTok doesn't get banned because. I'll be super sad because I never, I never got any traction like this on Instagram or I've been, I've been on social media in all different ways for a very long time. And I've never had anything like this happen. So it's, it's super cool. I just, I, I just want to say thanks for everybody for being so friendly. Like it's just been, it's been amazing. I agree. Well, we love having you as part of the community. Yeah. And being our very second guest here too, again. Um, And, and just, I mean, I truly do think that the listeners of our podcast, obviously they want to hear, you know, Jesse and I talk about theories and all the different things that we're researching and thinking are tied to what's next. But this is the type of stuff that like really broadens it. And I think that there's not a single Swifty out there that wouldn't, you know, enjoy this type of story. And I think, what um Mm -hmm. what your sons and obviously you and your wife have been able to accomplish is commendable and is there anything as far as advice that you would give to parents who either have children who are in dance or just have children who are beating each other up and need a little break like any kind of words (laughs) of wisdom as you reflect back find find what they love right find what they love and if they love it enough, I, uh, one of the things that we were always told is my wife and I were everywhere. So we would take them because they were younger. They weren't driving at the time. So we would drive them downtown to this studio or to this studio or to this. And there would constantly be people, people coming up to us and saying, oh, my God, I wish my parents were this supportive. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do, as a as a father I don't I don't understand why you would not want to spend as much time with your kids as possible as a as a parent the time with your children is finite like you have this much time and to dismiss a, a portion of your child's life because you don't think it's going to be a good career or you don't think it's, you know, dance is silly, dance is, you're never going to do anything in dance. You're never going to, you're never going to, I, I just don't get it. Like it's got to mm-hmm. be, right. Could my kids have done what they're doing now without my help? I'm sure they could have. I'm sure it would be a heck of a lot more difficult, maybe more time consuming, or maybe they would have just, given up and gone oh my god like this is way too much like I, I can't do this or i can't do this or man just renting an apartment for a canadian in california was insanely yes. difficult it's it's they should you know 
they should be thankful that I had the patience and the talkability to call people and say, you know, I'm in a different country and I need to do this. Can you help me do this? Right. It, it was, there were a lot of very difficult obstacles to overcome and they could use your help. Right. Like mm-hmm. we, we try and share our life experiences with our children. And the only way to do that is to be involved in everything they're doing. Right. So that you can be, I made a reference once before, you know, when you go bowling with little kids and they fold the bumpers over the gutter mm-hmm. so that when the kids throw the ball, the ball is guaranteed to not go in the gutter. Right. That's our job as parents. That's what we're supposed to do. We are those gutters to make sure the gutter guards so that our kids don't end up there, that they somehow manage to find their line, what they want to do. And then just, man, help them as much as you can. Just doesn't make sense any other way. Cause it just divides you at that point. If you're not, if you're not in, then you're being divided away from one another. Would you, would you say that you were their manager? I mean, were you their manager at some point? I mean, or did they have a manager? No, no. They had an agent here and they have an agent in LA. Um, yeah, mom and I were pretty much their managers. We called her the momager. Um, I was always the social media. I was sort of always the front man. I don't mind talking to anybody. I will talk. I will walk up to a perfect stranger. I used to work retail. That was my job. I literally had to come up to you and talk to you and try and help you find something so you could spend money in my store so that I could make a living. So I have no problem talking to people. So I was always that guy. I ran the Flow XS Instagram account uh, at official Flow XS. I, I got that to like 7K, but never got the viral video. Mm-hmm. My dance videos that I post on TikTok generally don't do very well the taylor stuff does much better like i try and sort of parent taylor dance i try and do a little bit of everything but you can clearly see in you know which ones go viral and which ones don't and the dance ones generally don't do very well but yeah i i I ran that account for i think it's coming up on a 10-year anniversary now and i i was posting there was a time I was posting daily to that account. Like it was crazy. I was trying real hard. Do you want to speak a little bit about flow excess and what that really truly is? It was so Mike's, Mike's old dance name was hydro flow. Um, that was a name he was given in high school. And then obviously the excess is the Kevin kid excess. And we were, we were trying as a family to sort of elevate them as dancers locally in Toronto. And we thought they're always together anyways. They're always dancing together. They were always doing the same classes. They were always pretty much always together. So we thought, okay, we'll just, we'll present them as a duo for now so that everybody knows the brothers. So in Toronto, you know, whatever, five, eight years ago, everybody knew who the brothers were. Yep. If, if anybody said the brothers, it was like, okay, that's Mike and Kev. We know who that is. So we just turned it into sort of a brand um, for them here. And then sort of once they got to California, we knew that their careers were going to kind of not be tied together anymore. And even here towards the end, obviously, with the movies and stuff, they were never really everybody still knew them as the brothers, but it wasn't quite so flow excess all the time. Um, They dance really well together because they've trained their whole lives together. So they are very different dancers. Like Kevin is a very flowy. Kevin can do the very gender fluid. He can, he has no problem dancing with Sam and lover. Like he can, he can do all of that stuff. Michael is very masculine in his, in his dancing and in his persona and he's very clean lined where, but it's wild because if you see them dance separate, first of all, you wouldn't know they were brothers. And then when you put them together, it's like, wow, they dance really well. Their timing is impeccable together. It's really cool to see. Um, so the, the, the studio that I'm in right now, the, this is like a, I did lights and we used to, during the pandemic, we had nowhere to go. I had built this dance studio in the basement. It's probably eight or nine years ago now. And it's just a little tiny room 
big enough for two people to dance. I put the floor like a suspended floor so it could bounce. Did some mirrored um, drawer like uh, closet doors to make like a mirrored wall on the one end. A couple of speakers, a little headphone jack, and that was it. And we filmed like you know for a year and a half. We filmed nothing but stuff down here and got colored light bulbs and. I, mean, Love that. I learned how to edit. I learned how to edit videos during the pandemic because that's all we did. We filmed. They took remote classes. We filmed it afterwards, and I would edit it and post it and throw it up on the Instagram site. So, yeah. And then, like like I said, as they moved to California, it kind of it's flow access is still there. They still teach a class weekly uh, in Burbank at Movement Lifestyle. They've been teaching for years. They're fantastic teachers. One of the blessings of having so much exposure to so many teachers is they were able to turn themselves into amazing teachers. They pulled yep. from all the different people that they learned from. They So uh, that was like a, a huge thing for them when they moved to California. First, they were asked to sub at um, Millennium Dance Complex, which is like there are two big dance studios in L.A., one is Movement Lifestyle, one is Millennium. So they were asked to sub like a year into their stay in, in L.A. They were asked to sub the first time at Millennium. That was like total cool, full circle moment from a place where they were training when they were in their teens to now being in California and actually getting to teach there. That was super cool. And then Movement just reopened. The pandemic shut them down, but they just reopened a beautiful spot in Burbank. And they asked the boys to come in and teach a weekly spot so they teach every monday at 4 15 and if kevin's out then michael steps in and michael teaches on his own when they're both in town they both teach together and whatever if michael's busy and kevin's in town then kevin just teaches but that's still branded as flow access okay so kevin's teaching still while he's on the Aeros tour so he's there they they can't teach while they're on tour they can teach while they're on break so like yeah, yeah that's what yeah. that's what I mean like like in between shows. No, I think he means like the two month break, right? Yeah, yeah. Like oh, so okay. for the Christmas break and for the break like that they're on right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. I do want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast with us. Um, as you know, this is a newer kind of adventure for Jesse and I, and we we moved from TikTok onto podcasting to do longer form stuff. And so having interviews has been one of those things that we were most excited about. And so thank you for agreeing to come on and for spending your evening talking with us about your experience with Taylor and with your sons. And like I said earlier, I think it's going to be such a great episode. I feel like many, many of our listeners are going to enjoy this interview. Well, it was my pleasure. Thank you for asking. Yes. Yep. All right. And that concludes our recorded interview with Mark. So I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as we did. We are such a big fan and he's such a great storyteller and um, really, really great to hear his personal life and about Taylor. So if you are not already a subscriber of the podcast, please hit subscribe. Give us five stars if you're on any of the podcast networks or if you're watching from YouTube, make sure to hit subscribe on YouTube. We are going to shamelessly plug. Come on, we're growing. And this is definitely part of it. So again, if you are listening to the end, we just always, always appreciate your support. And as always, we love you guys. Bye.